Hi everyone, welcome back to another unit review with Sidecasts. I'm Tony, and today we'll be reviewing the first half of Unit 5 of AP Psychology, while specifically discussing the cognitive aspect of psychology revolving around memory, language, and problem solving. With this in mind, let's jump right into reviewing. To start, the first big idea of this section of the unit is memory, which is divided into sensory, short-term, and long-term memory according to the modal model. For instance, sensory memory is the connection between perception and memory itself, and only contains limited information. Specifically, visual memory is referred to as iconic, while auditory is echoic. The nature of this type of memory can be used to explain the concept of visual persistent, which is defined as the optical illusion that occurs when the visual perception of an object does not cease for some time after the ray of light proceeding from it have ceased to enter the eyes. Like for instance, how a jump rope can be seen to be rotating at many different points at once if it's quick enough. Next, short-term memory holds information for seconds and up to minutes with a capacity of up to seven items, give or take around two plus or minus. The storage is maintained by two types of rehearsals, maintenance and elaborate. The prior is simple repetition that keeps a memory there, while the later, the more effective one out of the two, utilizes organization and more in-depth understanding of information to remember it. Both rehearsals are labeled as effort processing as it requires conscious effort, unlike automatic processing that occurs unconsciously. Specifically, information in the short-term memory can either decay, meaning that they're forgotten and therefore exit the short-term memory itself, or encoded into the long-term memory that lasts for an extensive period of time, which could be the whole lifetime of the individual. Memories can also be interfered with, like retroactively, meaning new information will push out old information, or proactively, meaning old information makes it difficult for the encoding of new memories. So a very good mnemonic for this, which it may sound inappropriate, but it's a really good way to memorize it, is to remember the word porn. P is proactive, and which corresponds with O, meaning old information and push out new information. And then retroactive it corresponds with N, which is new, meaning that new information will push out old information. It's also worthy to know here the forgetting curve developed by Herman Ebbinghaus, which states that most forgetting actually occurs immediately after a learning, which stresses the importance of repetition. Moving on, let's discuss some methods and effects of memorization. One common method is the use of mnemonic devices, which of course I mentioned earlier with porn, which uses short words or phrases to represent more extensive information. Additionally, it's postulated by the dual coding hypothesis that it's easier to remember a word associated with uh, visual images uh, compared to word or image just alone. An illustration of this hypothesis is the method of loci, which involves creating visual representation of topics and then associating it with the environment of a familiar location. Lastly, the self-reference effect states that memories which are personally tied to an individual are more easily remembered because it interacts with our own views. Finally, with short-term memories characteristic to store information in a list, there's a tendency to more easily remember the very first item, the primacy effect, and the very last item on the list, the recency effect. This overall effect is known as the serial position effect. A method dealing with this list is known as chunking, which is grouping items of information into units for better memorization. An instance of this would be trying to remember a phone number, where you'll try to first remember the area code, then the next three digit, and then the last four digit. Okay, so let's now discuss the last type of memory, long-term memory, which stores lasting memories and knowledge that is organized as a huge network of interconnected information. This means that long-term memory exists as an organized network that is made of various connected but sometimes unequal nodes, like an association between pet and dog versus a weaker connection between, for instance, pet and crocodile. As connections between nodes strengthen, its retrieval also becomes easier and vice versa. It's suggested that most of the information is semantically encoded or in the form of word meanings, but other can be stored visually or acoustically, meaning both sound and sight. Moreover, the process of spreading activation illustrates that the initial nodes will spread stimulants onward to their neighbors, and this continues creating an amplifying effect. A way of grouping similar information is known as a concept like recognizing the object chair, despite, you know, there's different ones having different sizes, colors, and shapes. To recognize and fit a new information into a group, we will evaluate its typicality, or the degree to which an, uh, an item fits the average, which is referred to as a prototype. A superordinate concept, like the term food, embodies a huge variety of items, while a basic concept, like bread, involves more specific terms. 
and a subordinate concept is even smaller, like wheat bread. Many storage methods exist in long-term memory. First, episodic memory is a memory of events that we have experienced ourselves. Next, semantic memories are basically facts, figures, and just general knowledge that you remember. Then, procedural memory consists of known skills and habits. And from a broader perspective, episodic and semantic memory can be grouped as declarative memory, which are consciously considered and retrieved, while procedural memory is considered non-declarative, that doesn't require conscious consideration. A special type of memory in long-term storage is known as flashbulb memory, which is a very deep and vivid memory in which a form of visual image is associated with an emotionally provoking event. Retrieving information from long-term memory is subject to context-dependent and state-dependent memory, which, of course, as the name suggests itself, can be better remembered under a similar context or state of mind. In some scenarios, memories are remembered in part instead of a whole. The process of putting together the individual pieces of an event is known as memory reconstruction. A cause of this process is source confusion in which the individual fails to know where the piece of memory comes from. An intentional method of implementing false memory through the use of misleading questions or repeated suggestion is known as framing. For instance, if a kid is asked to read and reread a book many, many times, they may connect the plot with their own experience instead of the book characters. The second chunk of this unit deals with language, which is basically the arrangement of sound, rhythm symbols, and body gestures to reveal and communicate ideas. The structure of language can be broken down into various subcomponents. Phonemes are the smallest meaningless unit of sound, while morphemes are small but meaningful parts that are created from phonemes. Grammar is the set of rules followed that governs syntax, the arrangement of morphemes. A semantics is the choice of word or its meaning, and prosody is the rhythm, stress, and intonation of verbal speech. The acquisition of language by human occurs actually in stages. First, infants up to four months would make noises that involve single vowel sounds. Next is the stage of baffling, which is the production of consonant sound. Then they would begin to utilize hollow phrases, which are basically single words that have meanings. And by year two, the infants slowly start combining these hollow phrases into telegraphic speech, which are two to three word groups. While a baby's vocabulary increases at a rapid rate, they make certain errors in language, like overextension, the overuse of a word to generalize different things, and contrary, underextension, the underuse of a word. Several postulates around the organizational language were formulated in the past. First, Noam Chomsky believes its organization is based on transformational grammar, which differentiates between surface structure, the superficial way words are arranged, and deep structure, the word's underlying meaning. His discovery of the similarity in the acquisition of language among various languages prompted him to propose an innate language acquisition device that controls language learning in a critical period that's most effective in acquiring the language. On the other hand, B.F. Skinner, which is a psychologist that you need to know for the exam, which is known for operant conditioning in his Skinner box, countered Komsky's argument by elaborating on the idea of language acquisition support system, which makes children's acquisition of language dependent on the language-rich or language-poor environment they were exposed to growing up. It is also thought that language is closely related and actually interdependent on thought. Proposed by Benjamin Leeworth and Edward Saper, the theory of linguistic relativity proposed that speakers of different language develop differently in cognition as a result of the differences in the language. The next concept I'll discuss is an important idea of cognition, which encompasses the mental process of acquiring, organizing, remembering, using, and constructing knowledge. For example, reasoning is a process of deducting conclusions from gathered evidence. The first type of reasoning is called deductive reasoning, a process of drawing logical conclusions from general statements. On the other hand, inductive reasoning involves drawing general assumptions from specific observations. To illustrate, if you observe a class of psychology students being very nerdy, you might generalize that and think every uh, psychology students are nerdy. To sum up again, just remember that deductive goes from general to specific, while inductive uses specific information to generalize it. Finally, the last section of this part of the unit is problem solving and creativity, which involves the use of innovative measurements to remove impediments of a solution in a situation. To discover a solution, one must consider and decide whether the problem has one or more solutions. If many correct options are present, the process of divergent thinking is utilized, like thinking about how to become successful in the future, which of course has many different routes and possibilities. 
On the other hand, convergent thinking is used when there's only one possible answer to the problem, like finding the answer for a multiple choice question. The prior involves brainstorming, while the later requires narrowing the choices available to deduce one. While attempting to problem solve, we often rely on heuristics or intuitive thoughts that are commonly known as rule of thumb. While this is actually easier than what we'll discuss later, the algorithm, heuristics may often lead to incorrect conclusions. The first type is known as availability heuristic, meaning drawing conclusions based on the event that readily comes to mind. For example, if you just saw on the news that a plane crashed, you might be scared to fly on one even though the chances of crashing are extremely low. The other type is representative heuristic, which involves evaluating objects and events based on how closely they match the prototype. The use of this heuristic often leads to wrongful interpretations like believing that all school athletes are less academically inclined even though that's far from the truth. Contrary to heuristic is the use of algorithms, which is the systematic, mechanical approach that guarantees an answer to a problem. While it requires more engagement, it actually often leads to a more accurate and better solution. Additionally, insight is the sudden understanding of a problem that usually involves conceptualizing the problem in a different way. However, insights are often hard to come up with because we have what is known as a mental set or a fixed frame of mind. An example of this is functional fixedness, the tendency to only use a given item for its intentional purpose. This is where the term think outside of the box comes from, meaning that you have to think separately from that fixed mindset to develop a creative and innovative solution. Here's some additional obstacles to problem solving. First is confirmation bias, which is the search for information that support a certain view, but can actually hinder the process by distorting objectivity. For example, if you're researching an argument and already have a belief in mind, you would most likely be satisfied when you find an article agreeing with your viewpoint instead of continuing searching for other perspectives. Similarly, belief perseverance is a tendency to see evidence supporting a particular position despite evidence presented to the contrary. Next, hindsight bias is a tendency after the fact to think that you were aware of the outcomes from the very start, which would also distort your judgment in situations. Lastly, as briefly covered earlier, framing or the way a question is phrased can also alter the objective outcome of decision making. The very last topic I will touch on is creativity or the process of producing something innovative and worthwhile. The elusive nature or the difficulty to capture creativity makes it difficult to study. But the pattern discovered is that creative individuals tend to be motivated to create for the shared joy of creation. They also ex exhibit care and consideration when choosing areas to pursue, and once they have decided on a field of interest, they would dedicate themselves in discovering and learning extensive knowledge of all the aspects of the topic. Lastly, they were believed to be correlated with a sense of nonconformity to the general rules, like Copernicus, who disregarded the widespread belief of the geocentric model that thinks Earth is the center of the universe to make discoveries about planetary motion. Well, that's it for the first portion of the unit for cognitive psychology. Now I'll pass it on to Vicky to discuss intelligence and testing. Hi everyone, welcome back to another unit review with SciCast. I'm Vicky, and today we'll be going over sort of the second half of unit five, which is cognitive psychology. Today we're going to be talking about intelligence and testing. So let's get right into it. Intelligence is the ability to learn from experience, solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. There's been a long time debate as to whether intelligence is a general ability or is a several specific abilities. So one psychologist that argued that intelligence is a general ability is Charles Spearman. And he created something called the G factor, which stands for general ability. So the main reason why Charles Spearman believed that we have one general intelligence is because he developed something called factor analysis, which is a statistical procedure that identifies clusters of related items. And he found that those that typically score high in one section, let's say, for instance, verbal intelligence, typically tend to score higher in another section, for instance, spatial ability. And this can be explained through the individual having one general intelligence, which allows them to score high in both sections. On the other side of the debate, you have another psychologist called L.L. Thurstone, who gave 56 different tests and identified seven clusters of primary mental abilities. 
However, researchers later found out that those participants who tend to score high in one cluster also tend to score relatively well in other cluster. So there's still some evidence of G factor in this research. Now let's talk about Howard Gardner, who also reviewed intelligence as multiple abilities. And as such, he developed the Gardner's eight intelligence. The eight intelligence include linguistics. So for instance, compositions of you know, reading and writing, logical, mathematical, musical, spatial, bodily kinesthetics, intrapersonal, which is how well you understand your own emotions and feelings, interpersonal, which is how well you understand the emotions and feelings of others, as well as naturalist, which is how well you understand nature and your ability to observe the nature. The reason why Gardner believed that there were multiple different intelligence was because he took into account of individuals with savant syndrome who are individuals that typically score low on IQ tests, but have incredible intelligence in other fields. Therefore, he believed that intelligence wasn't just one general factor. Rather, it was different abilities in many different fields. Moving on to another psychologist that also believed in multiple intelligence, and that is Robert Sternberg, who developed Sternberg's three intelligence. The three intelligence are analytical, which is AKA like academic problem solving. So this can be assessed by IQ tests and it's often referred to as the so-called school smart. Creative intelligence, which is the ability to react adaptively to novel situations and generate new ideas and practical intelligence, which is required for everyday tasks. And it could be of many things. For instance, your management skills, your leadership skills, your ability to motivate others, etc. And this is often referred to as street smart. Before I move on, let's talk about some related concepts to intelligence. Starting off with something that many people know as EQ or emotional intelligence. This is the ability to recognize people's intent and emotions. Next, we have fluid intelligence, which is the ability to process information quickly and solve new problems. With fluid intelligence, you likely obtain it early in life, but it also experiences a pronounced decay as you age. On the other hand, you have crystallized intelligence, which is accumulated intelligence. And compared to fluid intelligence, it has a less pronounced decay with aging. So we've been going over some theories. Now let's talk about some actual IQ tests. Starting with the earliest, which was developed by Francis Galton, uh, he attempted to measure intelligence through reaction time because he believed that speed of processing was a necessary component in intelligence. This actually didn't prove to be very true at all. Next, we have Alfred Bennett, which is someone that you absolutely should know for the AP exam. He measured kids' mental age to help decide whether they needed to be placed into a special classroom or not. And on that note, mental age is the level of performance associated with a certain chronological age. Something to remember is that one of Bennett's fear with his development of IQ test was that the test would be used to label children and limit their future opportunities. And this unfortunately came true uh, for his test later words was adapted for numerical measures of inherited intelligence. One example of the maladaptation of Bennett's test was the Sanford Bennett test, which was developed by Lewis Terman from Stanford University. So unfortunately the Sanford Bennett test ended up being use sort of in association with eugenics, which is when you test individuals and encourage only those with favorable traits to reproduce. For instance, you only encourage people that are highly intelligent to reproduce so that their offsprings and the future generation in this world would be smarter. Another test inspired by the Stanford Bennett test was the intelligence quotient or what we usually know as IQ. The formula to calculate IQ is one's mental age divided by the chronological age and multiplying that by 100. For example, if you have a 10 year old kid who has a mental age of 12, you would do 12 divided by 10 times 100, meaning their IQ is 120, which is relatively high. Unfortunately, though, the IQ or the intelligence quotient only works really well with children, and it doesn't really seem to be proven effective in regards to adults and measuring the adult intelligence. Now let's talk about the most widely used intelligence test, and that is the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, aka known as WAIS, or I call it WISE. And I should also mention that there is also the Wechsler Children Intelligence Scale, also known as WISC, W-I-S-C. 
This intelligence test contains both verbal and performance or nonverbal subtests. Here, I want to introduce the idea of heritability. Heritability is an important and crucial concept in AB psychology, and it's the degree in which a variation that exists between a group of individuals is attributed to genetics. For example, if you raise two kids from different parents in the same environment, their intelligence difference would be purely due to their genetic difference because they are receiving the same environmental influence and they're in the same environment. Therefore, your heritability in this case would be extremely high. On the other hand, if you were to have two identical twins in different environments, since they have the same genetic information and the only difference is the environmental influence they're getting, heritability in this case will be extremely low. Now let's move on to talk about the components that make up a test. And a crucial component is standardization, which is the process of making a test uniform. For example, if you were to look at the SAT, every student that takes the SAT gets the same amount of time per section. Therefore, the test is standardized. Next is reliability, which is the likelihood that the same individual would get a similar score if tested uh, with the same test on a different occasion. And oftentimes, researchers would perform a method called test retest method, which is when they give the participants a test and then later words administer the same test on a different day or on a different occasion. Another method to test reliability is the split half method, which is when two halves of the same test are given to the same subjects and the results are then correlated. Now let's move on to a concept called validity. Validity is the extent that a test measures what it intends to measure. For instance, if you were to develop an IQ test, you want to make sure that the IQ test actually measures your participants intelligence level. Some subconcepts related under validity is internal validity. That is the degree to which the subject's results are due to the question being asked and not to another variable. External validity, on the other hand, is the degree to which results from the test can be generalizable to the real world. Last but not least, let's go over some type of tests that are mentioned in the AP Psychology curriculum. First is known as achievement tests which are tests that assess the knowledge gained. For instance, if you were to take the AP Psychology exam, it will be assessing the knowledge you gained from your AP Psychology classes. Second is aptitude test, which evaluates a person's ability. For instance, a driving test given to a person to obtain their driving lessons would be an aptitude test. Third is projected test, which is when ambiguous stimuli are presented for interpretation. And there are two main projected test that you should know for the AP exam. First is the Rorschach inkblot test. This is when the participant is presented with a series of inkblots and are asked to interpret what they see. For instance, you might see a bat, you might see a bird, you might see a person's face, and that interpretation would then lead the researchers to a conclusion. The other projective test you should know is the thematic apperception test, or also known as TAT, or as I like to call it, TAT. The TAT test is when you are given a series of pictures that have individuals with an ambiguous relationship and you are asked to come up with stories. And your story interpretation is then interpreted by the researchers for a conclusion. Lastly, you have the inventory type test, which is simply when participants answer a bunch of questions. For instance, on a personality test like the MBTI, which I'm sure many of you guys know. Now, before I let you go, I want to talk about the Flynn effect, which is that IQ scores tend to be rising over the years. So it's almost as if we seem to be getting smarter as a society. So that's it for part two of unit five. Thank you guys for listening. And if you're on YouTube, please subscribe and like this video and comment down below what other unit you want us to review. And if you're listening on any podcasting platforms, please follow our show and give us uh, a five-star review if you found this helpful. We look forward to seeing you guys next time and thank you and have a good day.